and Secretary of the Australian Geological and Geographic Society, and the Head of History of the Australian German Science and Energy College. On behalf of both these organisations, I'd like to welcome you here tonight for the seminar on the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change Special Report on 1.5 degrees. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, for the Kulin Nation, and extend this respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Today, uh, the public's got a problem with the microphone. It wasn't as good as it was a minute ago. Uh, I'll stand a bit closer here. Is that better? Mm -hmm. A bit closer here? Okay. Okay. Is How is this? Now, what's happening in the immediate future, at best, 
great guys. If you have an app that knows you are having that voice on, you can watch. <laughs> Three guys is what you got to That's huge. Even if you're on like seven guys and they're already on the app. You don't know, forget guys are <laughs> Probably. Um, a lot of it's a 30 year thing when you don't know how to get out of yet. It's a 30 year thing. Uh, shorter we can deal with and this fancy maths you can do uh, to put up with it to make up for your short haul in your 30 years. But uh, it's long term. Now let me tell you, in a day, a degree, a single degree, in fact not even that half a degree, can be the difference between a fine, sunny, beautiful day. Unless you're from England, in which case a fine, sunny, awful day. Um, <laughs> the difference between that and severe thunderstorms, huge hail, damaging winds, flooding rains, one degree. Forecasters know that really, really well. When you Add up that little little bit every day over 30 years or 50 years or 100 years. That one degree starts to make a difference. How about two? And that's what we need to talk about tonight. So I'm going to introduce our speakers, and uh, one of, the way this is going to run, so so you can understand. I'll, I'll introduce each of each of our speakers, give you a little quick note on who they are, so you know who is speaking to you. And then we're going to ask them each to kind of say a little bit about themselves and about the work they're doing. <laughs> then after that, uh, once all of our uh, four have had a chat, we're going to get into some questions and answers. Now, uh, a couple of quick notes. Uh, I intend as a year to keep this incredibly fair and balanced where the questions are. I'll ask them where they're popular. I'll ask them more about analysis. Uh, I do demand that your questions are respectful. And I'll chase that all the time. All right. That said, let's have some fun. What about climate? Okay, so uh, first off, the mark is going to be uh, Herb Goldberg. He is a professor of marine science and the director of the Global Change Institute at the University of Queensland. And crucially, also, uh, he served as a coordinating lead author the recently released IPCC report on the implications of on a half tourism. I specialize in climate change and also in coral reefs, and he'll have a lot to say about that. Sitting next to him is Dr. Sarah Perkins Kirkpatrick. I'm very happy I didn't get that name wrong. Well, you did well, you did really well. Well, it's a piece of case there. She's sitting in the chair and ask. Future fellow at the Climate Change Research Centre at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, her research focuses on climate change and extreme events, in particular heat waves. Again, and next we have a man that uh, many people in front of my face will know by name, Ross Starner. He's a professor, <clears throat> professorial research fellow. Incidentally, excuse me, Ross. I've been asked this all this morning. We just talked about a very great technology. We're excused by the time I've been making a breakfast break. But we're going to get through this. <laughs> Ross Gardner is a professorial research fellow in economics at the University of Melbourne. He's also a chair of the Energy Transition Hub. Ross is the author of many scholarly publications on international economics, public finance, and economic development. He has written a number of influential reports, as well you may recognize his name. Uh, they've gone to the Australian government. This includes the Ghana Climate Change Review in 2008 and the Ghana Review Australia and Global Response to Climate Change, which was delivered in 2011. And finally, Robin Eckersley, she's a professor in political science and the head of the political science discipline at the University of Melbourne. She's an expert in the international climate negotiations, in the international climate negotiations. Uh, having attended uh, six conferences of the parties, including the Paris negotiations in 2015. We've been about having five minutes meeting. We've been we already discussing the in Paris, so great. Uh, as well as uh, comparative climate policy and politics. 
Now I'm going to ask each of our speakers for a little bit. First, could I uh, at least have a show of appreciation? <laughs> This is Oak. Right, that's right. Now, does this work? Hello? It does? It does work. I'm not sure if you do. Yeah, you work. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here's your loud voice. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, I'd like to start with the first slide, which is the report. And just to give a bit of background, I arrived yesterday back from South Korea where the uh, report was gaveled down, which is where it goes line by line in front of the 195 countries that are involved in uh, the ICC and accepted this extremely arduous process. The last session was 30 hours long. But if you doze off in the middle of it, um, you might, your crucial bit of science might be able to look for an uh, extraordinary thing. So it's really an interesting um, uh, process. Um, so just to give those of you who may not know what this report is all about, the IPCC is the UN body that was set up 30 years ago, uh, its anniversary this, uh, this year, um, to really find a scientific consensus on climate change. Basically to sort through all the hot, hot air and different things and so on and say, what does the scientific peer-reviewed literature support? And so they generate two sorts of documents. The first document, is uh, the assessment report and they do that every seven to eight years uh, it's basically an assessment of all of the things going on within your nation and so on so it's basically a, a stock tank of, of the problems the solutions and so on out of that come special reports that are designed to sort of fill in on areas where there are gaps in knowledge or there are emerging uh, areas of concern and that was what this one was and so in early 2016, uh, the government's coming out of Paris, which had these goals of being well below two degrees and 1.5 as the sort of long-term target. Um, this was agreed that they needed a special report and uh, this was sort of established. Um, nations put forward their best scientists. They were then selected uh, by the, the, the board of the IPCC and then set off in this grand getting, getting all the science. And so just to give you an idea of the sort of numbers here, this is sort of what went into this particular report. And I don't want to just sort of um, concentrate too much on this, but things like 42,000 comments. Uh, so it's written by nine scientists that are supported by hundreds of other scientists through contributing, uh, uh, contributing authorships. Uh, of all, all of those comments, they have to be answered and put back up on the web. So you've got to have an answer for them. You can't just ignore them and say, I don't believe in that. So it's an extremely rigorous process. And um, you know, last week, this was what was gaveled down. Um, well, let me just tell you a little bit about the sort of what I see as the headline statements coming out of this, uh, this room. And here's the first one. And this is that um, climate change at one degree Celsius, which right there now above the pre-industrial period is already affecting people, ecosystems and livelihoods around the world. And some of those effects are advancing in size and scale very quickly. And you've only got to look at the Great Barrier Reef, which I study at the moment to realize how things have changed even just in the last five years. It's also become increasingly clear that, that humans are causing this. Uh, there's no reasonable doubt in the consensus science that this is somehow a natural cycle, it's not. And it's also clear that it varies regionally from place to place. And so part of this report looked at hotspots, places where you were getting perhaps one or two types of factors coming together, or it was just simply that uh, the weather system in those regions was changing uh, more rapidly than other places. And so places like the Mediterranean, Sub-Saharan Africa, low-lying islands and coastlines stood out in that respect. And of course, that uh, 
uh, we're not policy prescriptive, but that sort of feeds into um, a lot of interesting politics that come out of this. The SIDS or the small island developing states are particularly powerful. There's a lot of them. They don't have a lot of people, but uh, in these United Nations forum, they can actually uh, speak up. And of course, they have every right to, given many of them may lose their, their countries. But even so, with some places doing better or worse than others, overall, there's almost no part of the globe that's registering, not registering unprecedented change. So key message number two, are that there are really clear benefits to keeping warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to two degrees Celsius. This is actually in the scoping document that the nations came up with when they were making this request. Basically, they said, we wanna know what the value is. So we're gonna spend all this money constraining uh, temperatures to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial period. Isn't it just, you know, aren't there less costs if you just go to two degrees and just lump it? Well, this report clearly shows that the cost of keeping um, temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial is a lot less than the impacts you have to deal with and the cost of those impacts. Every bit of warming from now on really uh, is important. The third key line message is that it's not an impossible goal still. We have about 10 years left, but what it will require now, because we have not acted deeply uh, in the past, so we, if, we don't, if we started acting in the 90s, it would have been a fairly easy problem to solve. We're now at a point now where we will require unprecedented rates of change and transition in almost every sector of society. And I think this uh, is both you know, an encouragement, yes, we can do it, but it also means now we have to make these changes. Now you might say, well, again, we'll just drift up to three or four degrees, I'm sure we can deal with it. Most of the evidence shows that that's not true. You look at the rates at which extreme events are changing, the impacts, on unique and threatened species, the aggregate impacts on economies and so on. Those higher scenarios don't look very pleasing at all. And in fact, there, there really isn't an alternative up there. So we've got basically, this is what the report uh, says, we've now got about 10 to 15 years to uh, get ourselves on a pathway where we're nearly um, zero emissions by by the middle of the century. And of course, that is a huge uh, challenge. So are we on track? Well, if you take the um, emission reduction pledges and add up all of those that have been made by all of those governments, parties to this uh, agreement, you find that actually, no, we're not. If we stick on the pathway we've got right now with all the actions we've taken, we will end up at three to four degrees above the pre-industrial period. As I said, that is not, and it's a very ugly place to be. So we really need to act. And so um, we need to have renewables step in here. That's, the, if you look at all the mixes, and this is what the report does in, in later chapters, you start to look at what it takes and what you need to do to get on that pathway. And it is, really big reductions in the use of, of fossil fuels, for example. There's no way that it's compatible with exporting 30% of, of the coal that's needed across the planet to burn. There's no longer that, uh, that option anymore. This is about uh, getting renewables to supply between 50 and 70% uh, the primary energy from uh, 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 the middle of the century onwards. And the good news is that we are heading in the right direction. You look at the amazing uptake of solar, for example, uh, in countries like Australia, uh, states of the US, and so on around the world. And so really, it's about now amping up those, those, uh, those changes. At the same time, though, one of the other headlines of this report is that 1.5 degrees Celsius is not safe in its own, uh, in its own rights. Um, 1.5 degrees Celsius will be a fairly tough world to live in as it is. For example, if you look at, say, the Great Barrier Reef, um, at 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial, and there's been some great work done, done by Andrew King and others, shows that basically we will still lose 
70 to 90% of today's corals. But crucially, we won't lose the lot. But if you go to two degrees, you do lose the lot. So 1.5 is tough, but it's so much better than two degrees. So keynote message number four is a really interesting one. In the specifications for this report, it wanted to look at the climate situation at 1.5 degrees Celsius in the context of also pursuing sustainable development and the eradication of poverty. And this is a really overt reference to the fact that this is a complex issue. It's a Gordian knot. It involves people. You can't make decisions here without considering the other needs. For example, food production and energy production can come up against each other. You have to consider the mix of those different aspirations and goals uh, if we're going to get anywhere. And more and more we're hear, hearing more about this. I mean, um, the report goes into a whole range of, of different pathways where a range of different options are uh, uh, appreciated. So the big question is, where to next? Well, the most important step in this report is feeding back to the Paris Agreement from where it was born. Um, you might also remember that um, under the Paris Agreement, nations have to meet every five years to see how they're going and to adjust uh, their emission reduction. You can't increase your emissions as a result of it. You can only tighten them. But clearly, as I've said already, the current mix is not enough. This report will also feed into that discussion. And hopefully we'll see some big movements in terms of, of realistic approaches to solving this problem. Not to say that, that those nationally determined contributions are not um, sincere. It just means that I think people have not really appreciated the scale of this problem and the, the urge that we have to get it right. And so this report will also fit into the Talanoa dialogue leading to the meetings in 2020 with the idea that we get um, more realistic things. So the next and last question is, what does this mean for Australia? We've had some very interesting responses to the report um, over the last news cycle. Um, I would like to remind those parts of the landscape that Australia did sign the agreement a couple of days ago or, or, or approved the passage of the science. In fact, 195 countries did, Saudi Arabia, the United States, uh, and Australia. As we know from some of the great work that Ross Garno has done, we have a lot of skin in this game. We have ecosystems that are very brittle. We have farming systems that suffer from the combination of drought and flooding rains. Those cycles are becoming more intense. That, that, that whole um, the extreme events and so on that are going to be talked about later. And so I think it has to, I mean, there's no question about it, but Australia has to really um, amplify uh, this, um, its strategy to, to get this under control. Now, it doesn't help when people say, but it's only 1.6% of the total emissions around the planet. Imagine if I was a heroin dealer and I presented that argument in court. And I said, well, actually, I know I only sell to 100 people. That's only 0.1% of the total number of heroin addicts, so I'm not to blame. That wouldn't work, I'd hope. It shouldn't work in Melbourne. It doesn't work in Sydney. <laughs> so I think, as also pointed out for Roscano, we actually have an amazing opportunity uh, ahead of us. We have fantastic renewable resources. Uh, there is no way that we couldn't become the powerhouse in terms of renewable energy uh, in, into the future. Um, th and these challenges are, are really important for all the reasons that I've said. And in fact, this should be really valuable information for business. Why would you invest in fossil fuels knowing that this hard wall of reality is there and this is one thing that's discussed a lot in the report about what's left of the carbon budget before we exceed two degrees Celsius. Why we wouldn't be ahead of the game saying, okay, that, that one we won't choose, but if we could get into these other um, industries, then we're not going to strand our, our, our assets and our income. 
So I think there's some really interesting uh, discussions to be had. I'm going to Canberra next week to, uh, to, to address uh, our political representatives uh, in an information session. And I already know there's going to be some interesting um, discussions, but I think we're at the point now where we've got to, uh, with everybody else around the world, we've got to now start to take action on this problem. We're all worried sick. The science is there. You don't need much more to say business as usual is a very wrong uh, option. So with that, uh, I'll thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Sarah Perkins. No, I'm down Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Dr. Sarah Perkins, that trick, for I'm still getting right. Please make a roll. Actually, I think you need a second to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Anybody got any questions about ABC News Breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> I think, can you hear me? Sorry, sorry to interrupt me. Right. We, we good? Yep, okay. Excellent. Yeah. We've got a lot of slot. Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way, that's fine. <laughs> Just all, all the way to the okay. There we go. Okay, cool. Okay, so as Nate mentioned earlier, my expertise it is heat waves. I tend to um, analyze them from how they're changing in terms of climate change, what drives them from a physical perspective, how they're measured in the observational record, kind of the whole kit and caboodle. So that's effectively what we'll be touching on the next 10 or so minutes. Just reiterating what Ovin said in his talk, we have already warmed by one degree Celsius. This is at a global scale. And also the Australia land temperature change has been about the same over that period too. So this is just basically illustrating this for the global mean. Um, going for the last 170 years or so that we're, you know, we're pretty much at that one degree threshold already. What this has meant already is quite a lot of extremes that we've already experienced. Now this summer in Europe and in the Northern Hemisphere is just one example, um, but it was basically, you know, the Northern Hemisphere was on fire as it was repeatedly mentioned in the media. We had heat waves over uh, Western Europe. We had wildfires in Canada, um, in parts of America, in Greece, they were all quite destructive. Tokyo was recording some very intense and humid weather, which was exacerbating heat, uh, heat, extra, uh, heat stress across that country. Um, and also in you know, Spain, it does get hot, but they're also seeing record breaking temperatures there as well. And these extremes, which were all um, mostly unprecedented, all very concerning, were all happening in a world where only warmed by one degree Celsius. In Australia, that's no exception as well. As I mentioned, that's also how we've warmed as a region. And we have seen changes in heat waves over the continent as well. Now, what I'm trying to get across with this slide is those changes in heat waves can be complex for reasons I don't have time to go into tonight. And they do change depending on where you're located. So, for example, over Sydney, uh, which is the top row there, we've seen the heat wave season, which is the last column on your right, start almost three weeks earlier within a 60 or so year period. That's on average. Canberra, on the other hand, which is the bottom column, hasn't really seen an increase in the intensity of heat waves, whereas most other capital cities have but they see a doubling of heat wave days, that's the lucky number 13 down there, over that 60 year period. Melbourne has seen a quite a high increase, a relatively high increase in the peak intensity, although not as much as Adelaide. And they've all, down here you've also seen an, um, an earlier start to the heat wave season over that record too. So what I'm trying to get across here is with that one degree warming, or really less, because this is really only taking into account up to 2011, we've already seen notable and detected, detected changes in heat waves. It's just those changes can be quite relative to that location, but they're definitely there. This figure is just simply showing how average over Australia we've seen an increase in the frequency of extreme heat events. So these are looking at temperatures, I think above it, the threshold was 35 degrees Celsius. Going all the way back to 1910, you can see that clear trend that as we've gone through time, again, just under one degree warming, the frequency of these hot days has significantly increased. There's no two ways about it. As uh, Nate also mentioned in his opening remarks, we don't need a large change in the average temperature to see disastrous changes in extreme events. And this is not only for their intensity, it's also for their frequency and their duration as well, as I'll demonstrate later. So this is showing, this is the standard figure that climate scientists generally show, also statisticians too, on how you see a shift in the bell curve to the right, which is warmer conditions. And you see 
you know, this drastically large change in the weather that was once considered hot now occurs much more frequently. And you also see extremely hot or unprecedented weather occur more often. So for me as a climate scientist, this is my bread and butter. This is what I know and do and live and breathe every day. But recently I was uh, presenting to some uh, parliamentary officials with a colleague of mine and they put their hand up and said, look, we understand this, we get this, but not everyone does. Not everyone gets science, not everyone understands a bell curve. And they actually asked me to find another analogy to explain this. They put me on the spot. I didn't know how to do it. I was just like, well, it's simple. Look at the diagram, you shift it. This is what happens, <laughs> can't you see this? And I realized how, you know, ignorant I sounded myself. So the best way I can explain it to you, and this goes to show what the other half of my life is at the moment, is bath time with my toddler. In the bath, we're happy. She's all cheery and you know, generally a good kid. Fast forward five minutes later, and it's hell in a handbasket. And all we literally did in this situation was take her out of the bath. That's all we had to do. People are laughing, people are sitting, uh, snickering, because I'm sure most of you have been there before. But also it just goes to demonstrate you don't need a small, you don't need a large change in this relatively stable and small, um, small environment to have this literally complete 180 in, mood, in the mood of a toddler. Okay, so it's, for us it means nothing. For us getting out of the bath hopefully is a very easy and you know, non-event of a task. But for a very sensitive system, it's a big deal. And this is exactly what we're going on with climate and changes in average temperature and extreme events. So hopefully that illustrates the point a little bit more clearly. <laughs> so future, so what, I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to attempt to do in this slide is showing how we used to do climate projections or what used to be the main tool. We used to look at future projections under certain climate scenarios and we tend to compare one period in time with another. So this is looking under the business as usual scenario, which is the, the, unfortunately what we're tracking, but also the worst case scenario comparing changes from the, the historical records, 1950 to 2005, against the end of the century. So this is effectively where we're heading by the end of the century. So the figure on your left is showing the changes in heat wave days. So this is the number of days we expect to see in a season that are part of a heat wave. Parts of Australia will see, you know, 10 to 20 more heat wave days per year, that's in the south. Up in the north, this is looking more like, like 45 to 50, 50 more days a year that are considered part of a heat wave. That's a very significant and drastic change. There's no two ways to slice and dice that, I hate to say. The figure on the right is showing that the hottest part of a heat wave, how much hotter will that be in the future at this particular time period? Now, parts in the south are about, you know, three to, two to three degrees hotter during, during those hot heat wave events. It's also worth pointing out that those are the areas that actually experience the most intense events, intense events already. So they're only going to get hotter still. So this is how we used to do it, or this is how we can still sometimes do it. You, you take a point in time, you look at the projection. The issue is around this though, that global warming at this time, depending on the model that you look at, it could be three degrees, it could be five degrees. There's that range of uncertainty of how, how much warmer will it be globally averaged at that particular point in time, which is how we've sort of moved into the global warming threshold scenario. So this is another way of looking at it. Here we've got four different ways of looking at heat waves. So we've got the number of heat wave days per season, which I've already taken you through. On the right hand side at the top is the hottest part of a heat wave. Bottom left is the seasonal number of heat waves, so the number of events we experience in a season. And the bottom right is the length of the longest event we expect per season. And I'm look, looking at just seven different global regions here. So this is an, an analysis I did uh, with the intention of the, the latest report. Now there are, there are a few key messages here. For every single region, you see an increase in the intensity, the length, and the number of heat wave days we experience. The warmer it is, the more global warming we have, the bigger that increase is. There is no other way to slice and dice. It doesn't matter when that warming occurs, when we experience that particular threshold of global warming, we will see that increase. Interestingly, with the seasonal number of heat waves, so the number of heat waves we get each, each season, we see something interesting happen. So at one and a half to two degrees Celsius over tropical regions, which is what those regions are, <laughs> they start to decline. Now what's actually happening here, we're not going, oh yeah, we're getting less heat waves, that's great. They're morphing into one long, hot event. So again, this is a tropical climate, There's, there are meteorological reasons around that, but they're getting longer and perpetual effectively. And that starts to happen in these regions by one and a half to two degrees Celsius, that's concerning. Some regions don't tend to, that doesn't happen necessarily until much warmer, but that's ultimately where we're heading. Moreover, when we look at the intensity of heat waves, so the hottest heat wave days, 
For most regions, that's warming faster than the global average. So just because the globe might be one degree warmer, it's not enough to say that heat waves will only be one degree warmer too. Over places like the Mediterranean, they might be two degrees warmer. That's what we're looking at. And lastly, with the length of the longest event, it's not a linear relationship. It's not a one-for-one -one relationship at all. It actually starts to turn into a, um, you know, a much steeper relationship as we hit, hit higher global warming thresholds. So this is a take home message. Limiting man-made climate change will reduce the intensity, severity and durations of heat waves absolutely everywhere. And depending on where you are, that limitation is you know, more important or you know, more drastic, I guess you could say. So within the report, there were mention of some specific extreme heat events and how they'll change under, under these um, warming thresholds, one, uh, one and a half to two degrees Celsius. So this is just looking at a number of extreme heat events over Australia. This was produced by a colleague of mine and looking at how much more often they occur. So particularly when we consider these long, intense summers, so for example, the summer of 2013, uh, the, the coral bleaching event that occurred in 2016, the hot, warm, the hot temperatures that drove that, um, and also the, the, the heat component of the drought we experienced 12 years ago, you can see basically the redder it gets, the more often that event will occur in the future climate. The numbers in bold is the percentage, how, how much more likely that event is, is to occur. If we consider a world without climate change, which is that first column there with the numbers in it, these, these events basically don't occur. Or they, they occur very little of the time. So they're much more unlikely to occur. We can, we can detect that there is a human signal behind these events. And as it gets warmer, these events occur much more often, almost to the sense that they become the new norm. That's what we expect to see most of the time. The same goes for, this isn't just an Australia um, problem, it's a global problem. And this is looking at, again, from the, from the same colleague, looking at projections of extreme heat of particular events, not just an overall projection under these global warming scenarios. And once again, you can see when it comes to hot weather, which is the first three main columns, they, these events will occur much more often in these warmer worlds. So the Europe, European heat, for example, that only occurred two years ago, will occur almost every summer um, under a two degree warmer world. The European heat wave in 2003, which killed over 70,000 people, will, will occur you know, basically once every two years in a two degree warmer world, um, and a little bit less in a one and a half degree warmer world. And these frequencies are really important when we're considering impacts. Uh, the British Isles example down the bottom is actually looking at colder temperatures. And as you can see, there's no red. These cold events will not occur in the future. We've shifted that distribution. We've shifted that angry toddler into that much more volatile state permanently. We haven't gone the other way. We'll also see, um, because of these extreme temperatures, there's a greater population exposure. Um, and this, gets, this, this tracks with these warming thresholds as well. So if you look, you know, the, the higher population... Um, sorry, looking at the lower population scales, under two degrees warming, you've got 67% of 100 million exposed to this sort of extreme weather. The higher the population, sure, the less exposure, but you can certainly see that it gets redder the more extreme we get. So that's the take home message. The, the, large, the more warming we experience at the global scale, the higher frequency of these extremes and the more people we're putting at risk. I'd just like to touch on the fact that Marine heat waves are also a thing. So I mainly study atmospheric heat waves, which is what I've been talking about in this, in this presentation. But we also experience these warm water ex events in the ocean. They're, they're quite extreme. So within this warming threshold of one degree Celsius that we've experienced the observational record, we've actually seen an increase in marine heat waves and their frequency of 34% and their, their duration by 17% over the last 100 or so years. So we can see that in the observations. Not only, that, not only that, but their likelihood of increasing under certain global warming thresholds is also there too. So the bottom figure in particular, that's showing the probability of particular marine heat waves under a warmer world. The redder it is, the more likely these particular events are in certain locations. And the top figure is showing that for one degree Celsius. So you can see that difference yourself. The probabilities can change from you know, 10 times more likely to 50 to 60 times more likely in those particular locations. And the figures on the right are just demonstrating that for particular ocean basins as well. So again, the warmer, you, the warmer it is, the, the higher frequency you'll experience of these particular events. So I've just mainly touched on extreme heat in, in this presentation. That is only one type of extreme event, but it actually feeds into a lot of different impacts. So what the IPCC have done in this report is look at certain re re reasons for concern. They've also, they've not just done the science, they've done the impacts and mitigation pathways as well. 
Heat waves fit into a number of these reasons for the concerns. Here I've just circulated extreme weather events and large scale singular events. But it's, you know, they're, they're, they're affecting more than just changes in extreme heat. These, these impacts are, are far and wide reaching and you know, do cover, you know, we, we should be concerned about them for many different reasons. Not only that, but the impacts cover many different systems as well. So for example, warm water corals, as Ove's touched on, are highly sensitive to extreme heat. These marine heat waves that I showed on the last slide. If we hit two degrees, they're gone. Simple as that. Terrestrial ecosystems are perhaps a little bit more lucky in some ways, but as you're starting to hit that two degree threshold, there's a much higher likelihood that they will no longer exist. And that's just due to extreme heat. Crop yields will also be damaged by extreme heat. For example, um, grain, grains like wheat, if there's a heat wave, they can technically be sunburned and that yield decreases. Also, cows are really sensitive to heat as well. And their milk production, milk production will go down if it's, it's, if it's um, regularly hot. And lastly, heat-related morbidity, morbidity and mortality. Now, that's a pretty obvious one when it comes to heat waves. But the hotter it gets, the higher that exposure, and the more likely um, people will experience those extreme conditions. What we don't know about the future with extreme heat is how that demographic will change. We know at the moment, particularly in Australia, that it's more likely the elderly, the sick, um, the very young, the pregnant women who are affected by extreme heat. But perhaps that demographic will shift to cover a wider portion of the population as those heat waves intensify in the future. And that's something that we're not too sure about at the moment. So with that, I'll leave my talk there and say any questions for later. Just to reinforce one point that uh, Sarah made about the crying toddler uh, in the last chapter of, of my report in 2008, I, I talked about how uh, um, social and political and economic systems uh, in our civilization, if they're shocked beyond a certain point, fall apart. And so beyond certain limits of shock, uh, one can't really predict the outcome on social and economic outcomes, but one can be sure uh, that they will be extreme. And out of economic history, we, we know how uh, a big shock like high unemployment in, in Germany and uh, Central Europe in the, in the 30s uh, 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 led to transformation of political systems, lots of examples of that kind. And some of the shocks, the displacement of people uh, that would be associated with uh, the types of impacts on uh, even with 1.5 degrees create risks of those uh, sorts of outcomes. Uh, thanks uh, over for the overview and Sarah uh, of the uh, uh, report. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how Australia's mitigation effort fits into that context where we learn that to get to 1.5 degrees, we've got to have zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, uh, but even to get to uh, two degrees, we to do our fair share in the global effort, we'll have to uh, get to zero net emissions not that long after that. Um, uh, these messages are not very different from uh, those of my report 10 years ago, the very detailed modeling, of both of impacts and the costs of, uh, and paths of transition uh, were in the big report of 2008, 2011 for the Gillard um, <clears throat> Parliamentary Committee on Climate Change. I, I did a, an update, but didn't repeat the very detailed uh, modeling. Uh, one point I made then is that uh, uh, the, the, the hard part was going to be to get started and uh, uh, to get to the path to two degrees uh, was through uh, three, de three degrees, the path to 1.5 was, was through two degrees. We had to get cracking, show that we could actually make strong progress and uh, that, would, 
that would make uh, more ambitious outcomes possible. Well, how are we going against all of that? Well, in terms of policy in Australia, uh, I must confess I uh, did not foresee how badly things could go. Um, uh, we really, we, we have a government now that's committed not to make an effort on mitigation. Uh, uh, the only, well, we, we've entered the, uh, the, the commitment 26 to 28 degrees at, at Paris now, uh, as uh, Sarah and Ober have said, uh, the, the commitment is actually to, to the ultimate aim of two degrees and as close as possible to 1.5 and doing our fair share of that. And we've committed to, with the rest of the world, reviewing our efforts uh, every five years uh, uh, and gradually to increase effort uh, until uh, uh, the uh, two degrees as close as possible to 1.5 degrees is in sight. Well, we've interpreted uh, our 26 point, uh, to 28 percent commitment, first of all, as, as all will do un under the present government. Uh, and we've also uh, 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 said that uh, this is a sectoral commitment and in electricity will do minus 26 to 28. We haven't actually said we'll do anything in other sectors. Now, it happens that uh, we know now more clearly than we knew 10 years ago that it's much easier to decarbonize, much cheaper to decarbonize electricity than uh, other sectors. Um, we had for a couple of years a complete set of mitigation policies based uh, uh, on my recommendations uh, that, that were doing their job. Um, uh, out of, uh, after the review and the consideration of the review, uh, uh, and the discussions uh, within the political system of all of that, we ended up with uh, a climate change authority uh, that was going to be uh, recommending on targets to the uh, to the parliament uh, with a lot of independence. Uh, if the parliament couldn't uh, agree to vary the recommendations, the recommendations would become law. Uh, the, we had uh, a, a series of institutions, uh, interlocking institutions that were going to give a big impetus to uh, decarbonisation of the electricity sector, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, which was to support um, uh, innovation, uh, new technologies uh, for, uh, uh, for low emissions energy, uh, the uh, Clean Energy Finance Corporation to, to make sure that in this risky and, and poorly known sector, the characteristics of our banking sector didn't get in the way of funding uh, uh, investments in the renewable energy sector. Um, we, we had uh, the centerpiece of it all was the, uh, the, the um, uh, carbon pricing, uh, which was legislated in 2011. Uh, it was a fixed price for a couple of years um, and uh, negotiations were completed during that couple of years uh, for uh, us to become part of the European Emissions Trading Scheme uh, from July the 1st, uh, uh, 2014. Um, uh, the the uh, arrangements included uh, offset arrangements funded out of the carbon price uh, that uh, um, provided incentives for uh, sequestration of uh, carbon uh, in, in land use, in uh, agriculture, pastoral activities, woodlands uh, uh, and forests, uh, and which depended on the carbon pricing. Well, uh, when uh, Mr Abbott became Prime Minister in 2013, he was committed to getting rid of all of this. And I should mention uh, also uh, uh, from that period, we had the renewable energy target to uh, uh, provide 41 terawatt hours of, uh, uh, of grid level power then expected to be about 20% of total power from renewable energy. Well, Mr. Abbott uh, came to power committed to getting rid of everything except the renewable energy target. In office, he uh, overperformed against his uh, commitments and, and set out to try to get rid of the whole lot, including the renewable energy target, and, uh, and looked as if he was going to succeed because uh, uh, the Palmer United Party had four senators who had the balance of power 
in the in the Senate, and he had committed to back the government to basically get rid of this whole set of institutions. Uh, and then, rather remarkably, some of us noticed on saw on television uh, one afternoon, being from Canberra, a joint press conference of uh, Mr. Palmer and uh, Al Gore, at which uh, uh, Clive Palmer said. Uh, I used to think that climate change was a lot of rubbish, but I've been talking to Mr. Gore through the day, and actually I think it's very important, and I'm going to uh, oppose uh, the legislation to get rid of all of these institutions. Uh, now, he's very uh, clever. He said, there's one exception. Uh, I, I, I won't oppose the repeal of carbon pricing. I'll support that. Uh, and then... Uh, but then I'm going to reintroduce a new bill which will do the same thing in a better way. Um, uh, as a result, we still have all of those uh, institutions uh, except for carbon pricing. Now, carbon pricing, uh, of course, once he reintroduced a, a bill, there was no support in the House of Representatives or it didn't have a majority, so that came to nothing. Uh, later, uh, when Palmer was in uh, trouble uh, before the courts of Queensland on having used uh, twenty million dollars from uh, uh, from a company that had gone into uh, bankruptcy to fund the political party. He, he he said no, that was good use of that money. Uh, uh, I I saved the company eighty million dollars that it would have had to pay in carbon price, and I only paid twenty million for it. It's the best investment I ever made. Uh, so uh, Palmer uh, voted to save every bit of the architecture expect, except the bit where, in which he had a personal vested interest of $80 million. Um, uh, in other political systems, I think this could not happen without large legal consequences, but we're rather uh, generous uh, in our uh, treatment of conflicts of interest in the political system. But, but anyway, uh, the survival of uh, most of the uh, architecture, but not the carbon price, uh, but in including a um, honed down, a reduced version of renewable energy target, has kept a fair bit of moment, momentum in the electricity sector and emissions in the electricity sector have been falling. Uh, um, but in the rest of the economy, they, they've been rising. Now, one big development that I must say I did not foresee, I did, did not foresee a couple of things. One was where our politics were going to end up on this question. Uh, the, the, the other was that uh, there's been far more progress in reducing the costs of in, renewable energy than uh, I anticipated at the time. I, a terrific team of people working with me on the very detailed modelling of the Australian economy through uh, a decarbonisation process. Uh, and we talked to uh, uh, all of the experts with hands-on knowledge of uh, the new technologies, and we wrote into the modelling uh, an assumption that the costs of solar photovoltaic uh, systems would fall by a few percent per annum. Uh, well, that was 10 years ago, and that was a few percent per annum in real terms. Uh, what we now see is that those systems have fallen in cost by about 85% in nominal terms, much more in real terms uh, since uh, a decade ago. There have also been very large reductions in uh, wind, wind turbine costs, uh, but not as, not as large as in uh, photovoltaic, probably 60%. Uh, and these cost reductions um, are, to a considerable extent, the result of uh, um, business responses to opportunities created by mitigation policies in many countries. First of all, Europe, the European market was crucial in developing scale uh, for photovoltaics and uh, wind turbines. It's a very nice uh, example of globalization working productively. The whole system that's brought down solar costs so much has started with training of bright young Chinese uh, in electrical engineer, in engineering at the University of New South Wales. They've gone back home, uh, started businesses using this knowledge, uh, taken advantage of the growing market in Europe, especially Germany, developed scale which brought down the cost of 
what they were doing uh, to a point where uh, it was economic on in their home base, especially once it became supported by Chinese incentives and uh, then massively expanded uh, scale costs came down. As a result, uh, today, uh, in uh, favourable environments but, uh, for uh, wind and solar resources, then uh, uh, the, the total cost of uh, new uh, um, uh, renewable energy systems, even when they are firmed up by some combination of batteries, which have been falling in cost at a similar rate to uh, photovoltaics, uh, uh, firmed by batteries or pumped hydro storage, which is an old technology but being used much more now, um, or firmed by, uh, even for a transitional period, which can be relatively brief while the pumped hydro uh, is being developed, uh, gas peaking, um, or by demand management, and we've got much more technologically sophisticated ways of managing de demand to reduce peak loads when uh, energy is uh, more scarce and expensive. Uh, we're now in a position where the combination of uh, uh, renewable energy in good environments and uh, uh, and one or other of these means of firming the power when the wind's not blowing or the sun shining is substantially cheaper than new build uh, um, uh, coal-based generators. Uh, and in very favourable environments, like most of southern Australia, uh, most of most of Australia, uh, it's cheaper even than the cost of coal itself uh, in a coal-based uh, generator. So we've no, we're, we're going we're in a process now where uh, even without policy support, there's considerable momentum uh, in the renewable <coughs> energy. Now that doesn't mean to say there's not resistance to the structural change. Some people see. Uh, very large ad advantages in coal. Some people can't imagine that we can have a, a world without it, but we will actually have cheaper uh, uh, electricity uh, if we make the trend. So long as it's done within stable and sensible policies, uh, it, we'll have cheaper electricity if we make a faster transition than a slower one. I think that one way or another in very good environments like Australia, uh, we're going to get the transition by 2050, I, I can't see coal surviving beyond 2050, even without uh, policy support uh, within Australia. Obviously, it would go more quickly uh, if there was uh, the type of uh, policy support that the circumstances justify. Good news for Australia is that we are especially well endowed in renewable energy, much better endowed per person than any other developed country. So. Uh, it, you know, once the, the world is well into this transition, uh, we will have a huge advantage in uh, energy costs. And uh, I've talked about the potential of Australia to be the energy superpower of the low carbon world economy. And that, that, that will make us helpful to other countries' uh, transition as well. But in other sectors, uh, uh, we can see a path to uh, decarbonisation, to zero emissions. The, the technologies are available, but uh, so far in other sectors, mostly the technologies are not yet as low cost as as the old uh, carbon intensive technology. So uh, the absence of carbon pricing or uh, uh, other policy support uh, is, uh, is going to uh, block transition in other sectors in Australia. Uh, uh, the rough arithmetic when I did my report was about 40% of emissions for electricity, about 20% transport, about 20% industry, about 20% agriculture and land use. Um, the, the electricity has come down to about a, th a third of the total. Uh, electricity is emerging as the low cost path to decarbonisation in transport, the electric car and uh, public transport. Uh, and uh, and for probably about half of the emissions industry uh, in, in industry, perhaps more. In fact, in a lot of industrial processes, uh, decarbonisation is going to start with electrification, maybe production of hydrogen to reduce uh, uh, iron oxide into uh, iron metal uh, or to uh, produce, produce uh, ammonia uh, for fertilisers uh, without the use of natural gas. Um, 
so, so electrification, uh, decarbonisation of electricity is very important for these other processes, but there's going to be a big residual that's not going to happen uh, without uh, policy support in those other areas. And certainly in land use and agriculture, the very large potential for Australia uh, to sequester very large amounts of carbon is not going to happen uh, without explicit policy support uh, of the kind that we put in place uh, with the carbon pricing through the carbon uh, farming initiative funded from carbon pricing. Thanks. Thank you. I'm just looking for my slides. Oh, I have them. I should just go straight up here. Right, go right here. There we go. Set now, set. Right, well, I'm just going to do three things quite quickly, and I can talk quite quickly too. I want to look back to see how 1.5 degrees got into the Paris Agreement and how other parties managed to agree to get the IPCC to do a report to look at the impacts of 1.5 or warming um, beyond 1.5 degrees and also look at pathways to 1.5 degrees. I want to look at the significant and political implications of this report, and I want to look forward to see how the IPCC's report is going to play out in the next conference of the parties in Katowice in Poland. It's called the 24th Conference of the Parties, COP24. Okay, so looking back, um, I want to show you a picture of, hang on, it's gone away again. <laughs> Just bear with me. Let's keep going to the end. There we go. Who are these people? This is a group called the High Ambition Coalition. And they emerged out of the shadows just about about the middle week, middle of the two week negotiations in Paris in 2015. Now you've got 196 parties negotiating one of the most complex treaties ever facing humankind. And to do that, they don't do that as individual countries. They form into negotiating blocks. And typically those blocks work across the division between developed and developing countries. Um, there are many more developing countries uh, to these negotiations than developed. They are the majority. But what we find that inside these blocks, they develop very hardened negotiating positions. And so for those of us that have been following these negotiations since 1990, when the first intergovernmental negoti negotiating committee started, what we find is that it's like Groundhog Day at every single conference. But what we had was a group of uh, Tony de Bruyne, who was the late Tony de Bruyne now, he was the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands. He came up with this idea. He reached across to the EU, and the EU joined with a group of other countries that straddled uh, the developed developing country divide. And they emerged in the middle of the negotiations to stop, to, to put a a reality check, you might say, a climate reality check on the way this treaty was shaping up, which was a treaty that was going to be incredibly flexible. The parties had been locked in deadlock for a very long time, and the US and China were moving towards an approach that was very bottom-up, voluntary, flexible, that although you had to increase your ambition pledges in every five yearly cycle, there were no penalties if you failed to reach any given cycle. All you had to commit to was to make it more ambitious each time. It was incredibly flexible. And so the most vulnerable countries in the world, the small island developing states, the least developed countries, the African group, and many countries with large coastlines that were very vulnerable, like Indonesia to our north, um, although Indonesia wasn't in this, country, this particular group, they got together and insisted on 1.5 degrees being included in the temperature target. Back in 2009 in Copenhagen, 
the parties agreed on a two degree guardrail, but again, the most vulnerable parties got 1.5 degrees in there. And again, they got um, promise of a review of 1.5 degrees by the IPCC. And so this is what emerged. Now, this was part of the grand bargain. And these conferences usually, when they do finally get over the line with agreement, is a grand bargain. So what the major emitters got maximum flexibility. And these pledges were not housed in the agreement. They were not legally binding commitments. They were nationally determined contributions. So this, came, this ambition was very important and it had this huge moral capital and it started to snowball during the course of the second week of negotiations, by which time everyone was clamoring to join. The US joined on the Tuesday, the negotiations were scheduled to finish on the Friday. And then Brazil and then China thought, okay, we'll move, India moved. And finally, Australia said, can we join? And they said, what? <laughs> what have you got to bring to the table? But Australia did become part of it. And then at the New York, at the signing ceremony of this uh, treaty in New York the following April, Australia was snubbed. It wasn't even invi invited to the meetings. And as Tony de Broome said, you have nothing to give this coalition. So that's the background to it. So what are the political implications of this report? Well, it's a massive wake up call. It's the most significant IPCC report to come out since the very first one which kick-started the negotiating committee to, to produce the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed off back in 1992. It also puts the idea of a carbon budget into the mainstream, into general circulation. Um, it also starts to talk about the elephant in the room. One of the noticeable things about the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Copenhagen Accord, and the Paris Agreement is that there's barely any mention of fossil fuels. Back in the Framework Convention, it's mentioned just twice. And that was put in there by countries led by Saudi Arabia to guard against the adverse effect of climate policies on countries with a strong fossil fuel dependence. So it was a protective measure to protect the fossil fuel industry effectively and the countries that depended upon it. So no one was prepared to mention this. And the, the approach was to say, we just have to reduce emissions, we'll leave it to nation states to decide how to do that. Now, we cannot go forward just with mitigation policies. We cannot just go forward with um, doing our best to promote renewable energy. We cannot just go forward by having sector-wide policies, not just in the electricity sector. We cannot go forward without phasing out fossil fuel. We can't just expect the carbon price to do that or to renewable energies to see fossil fuel just slowly wither without a fight, because we see it will fight. It will fight politically and economically. So trying to get the idea of a carbon budget out there in the public imagination, not just amongst climate policy wonks, is a really important political task. And that's why fora like, like the one we have tonight is really important in getting that message out. So where we are in the international negotiations, and this is a really useful little diagram prepared by the World Resources Institute, which shows where we are right now and where we are going forward. Think of this as trying to whip up a green beauty contest amongst the states of the world. Think of this as a massive collective task where we have to work on every front as hard as possible. Because as um, Ova said, 1.5 degrees holding warming to no more than 1.5 degrees is possible, but it's gonna have to require heroism, quite a lot of heroism right across society. So in 2018, um, in Katowice in Poland this year, at COP24, the parties are having a facility of dialogue or called the Telenoa Dialogue. And the idea there is to try and goad further ambition because when all the parties put their pledges, called, they were called intended nationally determined contributions in the year leading up to Paris, they did that rather conservatively because they didn't know what the full shape of the treaty would be, what the nature of the commitment would be, what the penalties might be. So they were all sort of hedging and being fairly conservative. Now they know it's quite flexible. Every, the, the idea is for parties to try and raise that ambition up to 2020. This is their, 20, their pledges through to 2030. One country, the US has one up to 2025. So the idea is try and raise those nationally determined contributions and then um, have a global stock take in 2013 and then start the process for a next round of um, pledges 
for the next five years, and so on, in um, onward, ever upward cycles of ambition. And so this is where we are at the moment. And this report is fantastic ammunition for the most vulnerable states in the world, which there are many, in the Pacific, um, in the Indian Ocean, in the Caribbean, and low-lying island states, um, low -lying, states with low-lying coastal areas. So this is gonna be very important in that process. And of course, NGOs and so forth. But when we think about climate change, we think of mitigation, but there are actually four elements to the climate change challenge. And I'll just finish on this point. No, I will say something briefly about Australia, very, very quickly, can't help myself. The four elements are mitigation, adaptation, Whatever we do, we're going to have to start think, developing a comprehensive adaptation plan at every level of government right throughout the world so we can try and withstand the changes, the harmful impacts that are already locked in. The third one a lot, is called intervention. And of course, the IPCC uh, expects to see carbon withdrawal or drawdown in the second half of this century. It's actually quite important. So developing technologies for that is important. Finally, loss and damage. There's going to be massive harm caused around the world um, that we're already seeing this at one degree, and that's going to grow even if we succeed in this heroic task of holding warming below 1.5 degrees. This damage is going to be uninsurable because it's incalculable. It's strange that we can insure things that are calculable and knowable, but things that can work on this sort of scale are incalculable. Ins the insurance industry will busily start rewriting contracts. So who's going to suffer? This is a justice question. This is a moral question. Those countries and communities that, that contributed least to global emissions, that have the, the minimal capacity to adapt, and who are going to be hardest hit because they're extra sensitive to the exposure to these impacts, it's a triple whammy injustice. There is this thing called the Warsaw Mechanism on Loss and Damage, but it's not, it's a disaster risk ma management information facility framework. It's not really helping, it's not helping in the degree to which we want. So they're the four levels on which we need to think. So who's going to pick up the tab? Governments. It's going to come out of consolidated revenue. If, if this sort of damage is not covered, someone's going to pay for it or it's not going to be paid for. So that's where we're at. So when we now look, and it's my final point, at the absent, the policy-free zone that we have in this country when it comes to climate policy, um, we have to, uh, these are the questions we need to ask our national government. The implications of your refusal to do anything um, to try and prosecute your Paris pledge is that you expect the rest of the world, particularly de developing countries, to carry that burden. That's if you accept the target. They've just signed on to this report that assumes they do, they do or they expect the next generation of Australians to really have to tighten their belt and so that emissions can fall off a cliff, which they have to do, or they have covertly abandoned um, even two degrees and are comfortable in accepting the consequences of catastrophic climate change. One of those three has to be right, or it could be a mixture. So we do need to put that question to this government and see if they can answer it. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Once again, all of you guys. I'd like to uh, just start by talking to each of you um, as I do this and being very brief. Um, one thing I noticed from, from all four of you speaking, obviously, what is incredibly passionate. Um, there's one particular area in the world that stands out um, for me. And in Australia, it's an important one, not only because it's part of our country in that, that world, but also because we're surrounded by many Africans who live there, and that's, that's the tropics. Um, Sarah, you sorry. Obviously, about the effects of heat waves through parts of the tropics to the coast of Australia. Um, Thank you. Now, when it comes, I, I can't help but ask the question. Uh, 
how much of our problem with climate policy has a racist element? It's a big one. Let's go dive straight into it. I don't know. I feel like someone is a climate scientist. I don't know. How, <laughs> how's your feeling? How are those people going to be disproportionately affected? And how are we go? You go. Well, I think Roland um, articulated this. This is an ethic, ethical and moral issue. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't make it. Yes, okay. I don't it was oh. yeah, so yeah. Robin was touching on it. This is that we, we don't consider this issue that often in the ethical and moral. Is it on? Look at the words right. Hello. Uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah, I think Robin was sort of touching on this. This is, you know, this ethical and moral issue, all the moral components of this, not often considered. But um, recently, NSA came out with a declaration on the ethics associated with climate change. And it got enormous play because people hadn't really said, you know, this, this issue of Today, generations and generations in the future, or the haves and have nots uh, in, in today's world. And I think it needs to be developed much more because I think that is at the heart of a lot of the issue and the solution. But I really, when you start talking about that problem, I thought it was pretty great. Mm -hmm. Ross, you've got a point of view. Yeah, I, I've spent my life working on development and relations with. Asia and tropical countries. I don't think racism has got anything to do with with uh, uh, our uh, uh, elevation of ignorance to a principle on climate matters. <laughs> uh, the the ten percent of Australians who react in what might be reasonably described as a racist way to issues like immigration, if they weren't ignorant would be very worried about climate change. And then, or, Can I just... Yes, please. The climate treaty, the regime, if you think of the collection of treaties that, um, from 1992, have consistently put ethical principles in the regime. And the idea is that it's not like tariff reduction, the tip for tap, where all countries uh, reduce their tariffs on an even playing field, right? It's a case of... Um, affirmative multilateralism, the idea that the rich world uh, industrialised through the use of fossil fuel, develop significant economic capabilities, technological capabilities as result. And as the industrialising countries are trying to catch up, they're told, no, sorry, you can't take our route. Mm. Wrong way, go back. Mm. And that's effectively keeping the ladder down. And so this has stalked the negotiations. This is why it's been so difficult to come up with a agreed burden sharing formula. But the idea was that developed countries, and it's actually in there, it's a principle carried forward in the Paris Agreement quite explicitly, developed countries should take the lead in mitigation and they should provide climate finance to developing countries to assist them with mitigation and adaptation. So as not to keep the ladder down. And many of the NDCs by developing countries are conditional on that kind of finance. And that's the agreement, so they can leapfrog over a fossil fuel path of development with that assistance so they can pursue their legitimate aspiration to develop and deal with project problems in countries. So countries like Australia or any OECD country, because they are developed countries, have an obligation to provide significant climate finance. What did we hear Scott Morrison say about climate finance? <laughs> right? <laughs> there you go, it's right there. And also to engage in the executive action, to set an example, um, to reduce the cost so it makes it easier for those other countries to leapfrog forward into a clean energy and low carbon future. So that's there in the agreement. It's well understood by everyone. It's just not well understood in Canberra. <laughs> Alrighty, um, I have another question for you uh, from one of our participants here this evening. Uh, and please feel free to let all the last day. What are the chances that we will find technology to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere quickly enough? Preventive changes, climate change. I'm going to expand that just a little bit. What are we doing? Uh, well, there's a very old technology. Our atmosphere that's that's proven it's done it all before. Uh, our atmosphere was 
mainly, well, a huge amount of carbon in it, and no oxygen, a billion years ago, and <coughs> uh, algae and then plants got to work. And uh, we thought yeah. about it. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's still a very good technology that has scope for a lot of absorption through photosynthesis and then you can, then you can do something with the, 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 the uh, You can bury it under the ground and it's going to turn it off the ground. Yeah. But, uh, uh, now, there are mechanical technologies uh, uh, being uh, worked on in other countries in, in Canada, once in the uh, United States, I doubt that the Department of Energy now is doing much there, but uh, uh, they, uh, but uh, before we get there, we know that there are well-established technologies. In Australia, uh, the, the, uh, uh, our woodlands depleted by uh, um, introduction of feral animals by very low uh, value grazing, uh, have lost a lot of carbon, and uh, they can actually hold a lot more carbon than it was there uh, at the time of what's settlement, especially with the uh, heavy rainfall uh, in the north of the country. Uh, so uh, the um, use of biological systems in a systematic way uh, can make quite a big contribution in Australia. I might actually ask Sarah uh, to have a crack at this next one. If we're going to engineer our way out, in a way we've already engineered our way in, mm. lags, how long are we talking before we start to see some meaningful change? Really good question. Um, <laughs> getting right into it. It's difficult to say. So some, some evidence says it could take a couple hundred years, some evidence says it could be decades. And it also depends about what you're talking about. Uh, so with heat waves, for, I, don't, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, for example, no. but it does depend on that. You know, how long does that system or that extreme event take to adapt to the climate change and then to effectively unadapt to the climate change? And there's all certain feedbacks that may amplify the process to make it worse. Ultimately, if we reduce our emissions, A, can we undo those feedbacks and amplify the process or have they gotten the ball rolling and it's become a snowball effect? Mm -hmm. And B, if we can, how long will that take? So it, you know, it, it, it depends. It's not a, you know, oh, easy 20 years, everything will be back to normal. It's not that crystal clear. Yeah. I wonder on those kind of timescales, how changes to environments, to, to animals, will then make going backwards perhaps even undesirable? Well, this is exactly right. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we lose things, and we are losing things now, for example, the Great Barrier Reef, that we can't regain. In right, but I mean, even beyond that, then evolution might push certain creatures towards them uh, being perfectly adapted for a hot environment. That's true. Which There's, is then where it's going. Well, that's true. You know, I have, I have heard another coral reef expert say that, yes, the reef dies, we can't really know it, for example, but new species may come in and colonise. But that's not the intrinsic value of what we're currently experiencing, and that's what we will ultimately lose, not just in the Great Barrier Reef, but there's many other ecosystems there as well. Mm -hmm. okay, so, will, the, um, will the reef be a dead thing, or will it be a moved It'll be a different. So, if you're not going to buy it for yourself, I think you see a very patchy distribution of, of coral and other ecosystems, and it still looks sort of functioning like the Great Barrier Reef. Get to two degrees, and you've got, you know, every year conditions go beyond what corals and other organisms can sustain, and so you'll have a lot more blueberry bacteria. Mm -hmm. Less favorable things um, than, than we have today. This, this idea of irreversibility is a really important one because it, it came up in the negotiation and also the commission of the report over how you deal with overshoots <coughs> and that overshoot really exists. And um, if you just overshoot to, let's say, go to two degrees and then come down to um, 1.5 degrees, it may actually take 300 years. Uh, Get a long life of CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You could maybe start to do some geoengineering, and uh, but we're not anywhere near sort of having those um, technologies sort of developed. Yeah. Ross, I've got a question for you. Um, moving to 
more renewables are going, that is going to help us with these key emissions. Uh, but what other benefits would there be from moving away from the Oh, there, uh, one is health benefits. Um, carbon particulates in the atmosphere, both in coal mining areas and uh, in our cities. Uh, are this also lots of health problems and large health costs. Now, these have been a very sharp driver of uh, action on reducing carbon emissions in China. And it became quite a big political issue about five years ago when the uh, United States Academy of Science and the Chinese Academy of Science jointly did a study of, uh, of why life expectancy was 5.5 uh, years um, longer in the, um, south of the Huey River and north. And uh, the scientific conclusion was the largest figure, but the largest single contributor was uh, uh, the, the health effects of uh, the very dense uh, carbon particulate emissions uh, in northern China. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's been one of the drivers of uh, very large action in China. Uh, incidentally, uh, a ball of the changes uh, in, in the projections in my 2008 report, the one that's biggest is China, which the, the trajectory is very much lower than uh, had been anticipated. It's interesting uh, the difference when the thing is happening on a time scale that somebody sees. Yeah. I'm sitting now that I was yeah. at a time recently that I remember versus. 60, 80 yeah. years ago, it was more or, 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 or 100,000 exactly. young a kid, a babies and 100,000 old people are going to die in the next couple of years when they wouldn't die before. This is starting to become an issue in India. India is actually worse than China now for uh, uh, um, carbon particulates. And uh, this is starting to become a driver for uh, policy change there. In Europe and North America, there are very strict standards uh, which are enforced. Uh, uh, Australia has not been so concerned about premature deaths of babies and old people as, as Europeans, Chinese and North Americans. I'm not sure why that's the case. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Robert, cocktail, be excited. <coughs> well, unfortunately, I won't be able to do this one. Oh, um, been to them all. I know. Well, not all of them, yeah. both, but many. Um, this one, it's interesting because the COP last year, which was chaired by Fiji, but sent Ron, and it was this idea of the Tamanoa dialogue as a, as a Fijian idea. Um, they did a lot, but the Polish care has seen rather sluggish. I mean, Poland is the dirty man of Europe. It's very dependent on coal and it's been dragging its feet. And the last time Poland posted a COP, which was in Warsaw in 2013, it was a mega January in the international possibility industry all meeting at the same time. I had some business in negotiations. So I don't know why Poland is doing it this time uh, in the negotiations. It's not so they haven't, they haven't done a lot of preparation in the way that COP chairs typically do. So there's a bit of pessimism going forward. That said, um, in September, there was a fabulous big conference in San Francisco, a climate summit, which was quite extraordinary, where um, this new alliance is being caused, or called Tower of the Coal, led by the UK and Canada, and it's being joined by a large number of subnational governments and city governments. Um, and it's quite extraordinary, it's just global that's beginning to grow. And so here you have lots of organisations, um, some national actors and some states announcing all sorts of initiatives. Jerry Brown, California um, governor, um, you know, saying, announcing all these big things. So you've still got this momentum happening and you have triple see the website now for non-state action and that's kind of where the action is. And I think that's going to go with things and make it easier for national governments to start moving and shifting and starting to claim benefits that were really the result of initiatives happening further down. So look, it's one of those stories on the one hand, on the other hand. Um, and there's a lot of Americans who are really pushing these areas, saying, we didn't vote for Trump. 
And then turning up at these negotiations saying, we're with you, we're with you. Because I was at the Marrakesh negotiations and right on the day that Donald Trump won the election, the presidential election. And I arrived and it was like a morgue. If you hugged an American, they'd burst into tears. Everything kind of stopped and everyone was shell shocked. But they rushed to get the Paris Agreement to come into agreement about three, four days before this election announcement. And that was he growing because it took from 1997 to 2005 for the Kyoto Protocol to come into force. So this was a really big effort. They knew they wanted to sort of de Trump. What sure the language is. <laughs> so at the moment, it's kind of a mixed story. It's always on the one hand, on the other. So you have all these good initiatives, and you see certain forces uniting and doing bad things. So it's but it's a critical point, and I think Ross's point about the fact that the cost of renewable energy now has fallen south so quickly, you know, even if we didn't have climate change as a problem, you'd be mad not to go ahead with renewable energy future. And the co-benefits are huge. So it just makes no economic sense to, to start any new coal stations. So the really hard thing is how do you phase out what we've got? Because we need to do that we need to find the climate. And actually earlier this week, we uh, the financial room uh, Reviewers reported on a business meeting uh, where business leaders have committed to some action uh, in the absence of government action, which is an interesting move uh, from what happened this week. And actually, let's let's do it. Let's talk about what happened this week uh, with the federal environment minister and the prime minister. Who would like to share your <laughs> Can I divert yeah. the question? Please, yeah. please. So, so, they always say that you sort of um, you fulcrum or something that you want to hear about. Okay. Pivot. So, why is our country so different to the world <coughs> in terms of this issue? Well, let me tell you, they're in the north. We're in the south. That's the difference. Thank you for that. Right? And they speak lots of languages. We only speak one. Strong. <laughs> we have no concern with the champions of climate change. That's the single biggest issue. I've done a big comparative study of developed countries to explain variation, ambition, leadership, and leadership. And Germany is heavily dependent on coal, and yet we had. Angela Merkel has been the climate champion, the climate chancellor, although this year she's slowing a bit, but she's had a good run. Um, Maggie Thatcher got it. Um, Liberal Premier of British Columbia has had a carbon tax, the oversaw the, uh, the introduction of carbon tax. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's the governor of California, yeah. introduced a modestly type of legislation called Global solution that. <laughs> so there are lots of conservative champions out there. We just don't have them. There's John Houston, who's busy campaigning for the city of Wentworth. Mm. And until we do, we're going to be stuck in these toxic cultural wars. Mm. Now, it does need to be said that there's a revolving door of people between the Minerals Council of Australia and the College of Science, except Labor. Our current environment minister used to work in that part of town. And so there's a kind of group think there that I think is a serious problem. And it's, it's political science 101, we call it agency capture. Agency capture. And so there's good political science theory that can explain that. We also have pretty dominant Murdoch press. Mm. Why is climate denialism so prominent in the atmosphere and not elsewhere and virtually absent in the developing world? It's not just because we all speak English and share things, it's because we have, it's, it's not just because of the Murdoch press. But there is. I'm saying, I guess. Because he's very influential in Europe himself, right? And the, the press in Britain and so on. Well, in Britain, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but there's, it's less of a problem there. Um, but then Maggie Thatcher did a big job in closing down the coal mines, so it's been less of a heroic task for right. British. Much harder for Germany, where you've got those regionally concentrated communities heavily dependent on coal, dirty coal, lignite, brown coal. Um, so, yeah, we need to develop a just transition. Mm. plan for all of these communities and that's not rocket science. We could see this coming for a long time. We know our coal fleet, we know when they're all going to retire, we can start planning. That should be happening, it should have happened a decade ago. I'm going to ask another question and then we might think about starting to wrap up. This is far too short, by the way. Um, Jules has asked a few questions. Uh, I'd like to 
ask you one of them. Um, is there a scenario in which we can cut our emissions by enough to avoid <coughs> You said it's, it's necessary. Is, is it something that we can really do, or are we really just trying to mitigate the disaster that you said it is? Uh, well, there is a scenario where we can cut emissions enough to hold, uh, attempt to increase at least a reasonable probability of holding uh, increases to 1.5 degrees. Uh, we've already talked about how there is a path for electricity. Harder in some countries than here, but uh, that would require us countries that are very rich in renewable energy resources like Australia being exporters of renewable hydrogen and other sources of energy to countries that are very poor in those uh, resources like uh, Korea and Japan. Uh, in some densely populated countries with uh, very large energy requirements, uh, uh, nuclear generation power is a significant part of plans for the decarbonisation, especially China and India. Uh, that's much more problematic in Japan because of the, um, the, the location on the tectonic plate and, uh, and Fukushima really killed all enthusiasm for uh, expanding nuclear uh, power in, in Japan. But, uh, and uh, across other industries, uh, uh, we know the technologies that uh, can, can be instrumental in allowing us to decarbonize by 2050. Uh, some are expensive, but we're talking about much smaller parts of the economy than we are in the case of electricity, so it becomes manageable. Uh, and costs will come down uh, with, um, uh, with large-scale use. Electrification of transport is going to give us uh, but in the end, cheaper transport as well as clean transport. The electric motor is a more efficient motor than the internal combustion motor. So once we're producing electric cars in scale, we'll have cheaper and more durable cars. Uh, and uh, if that's using zero emission electricity, that will do the job in, uh, in for much of transport. For industry, for steel at the moment, nearly still come from two sources, a lot of recycling, uh, which in mature developed countries like Britain and the, and the United States is responsible for most, uh, well, in the case of Britain, all uh, new steel production. Uh, but countries are still growing quite rapidly, Australia because of uh, immigration and uh, population, um, uh, and still therefore a big uh, spend on new infrastructure recycling activity. Also, in current technology, uh, we use metallurgical coal for uh, reducing iron oxide into iron. Hydrogen can do that job. Uh, there are uh, electric <coughs> processes that can, do, that can do that job. At the moment, they're more expensive with larger scale use. They won't be so much more expensive. So uh, the, some very hard ones, where we, we don't yet know how to remove methane emissions completely from ruminant animals. So uh, if we're uh, committed to eating sheep and cattle, that's, that's going to be one of the harder ones. That, that will probably have to be offset uh, by uh, sequestration uh, of some kind or another. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Good job. Okay, quick. Um, Sarah, I have one question here. This may be one of the tough ones. Um, when we look at the report the IPCC put out, a lot of their errors are over the saying that the situation is very likely. We're, we're confident this is the case, error plus or minus 0.2 of the degree. When we're considering half the degree, usually it's between you know, one and a half and two in the future, point two sounds to some people like a pretty big error. Can you, can you talk to that? Can you explain what that means to you as, as a climate scientist and what that really is going to mean for us? So first and foremost, climate scientists are extremely conservative. So we don't, I don't get up and say I talk like that just because I feel like being the doomsday advocate. 
that's based on solid scientific evidence that we've carefully, it's, it's been carefully peer reviewed, we've carefully analysed the data. So it's not something that we've just put together in five minutes, basically. So when we come up with that 0.5 degree or one degree, or however many heat wave days per year, that's, there's a lot of hard work going behind that. We're also trained to give this level, and I hate this term, particularly when you know, in a public forum of uncertainty. So we're talking about climate projections. We can't look into a crystal ball. We use the best tools available to look into the future as much as we possibly can, can based on fundamental physical principles. We're doing the best job we can. But they're not perfect. No future projection is whether you're looking into your crystal ball or not. So we have to give those levels of uncertainty around that. Okay, errors, for, which is also another bad term, but that's what we have to do. You know, each climate model, when I, was, so when I was showing those projections of future climate by 2100, some climate models warm by three and a half degrees Celsius by that threshold, by, by that year, others warm by five degrees Celsius. So is that uncertainty as to what it will be at that particular point in time. So we do have that some level of uncertainty. At those particular levels, that plus or minus 0.2 degrees doesn't actually mean much really. When it means, yes, when we're talking about 0.5 degrees Celsius, it could be 0.7, it could be 0.3. But we're already seeing those extremes occur if, you know, we're talking about 0.5 degrees, they may be slightly less at 0.3, but they will still be happening and they're still worse than what we're seeing now. And that we're certain. The amount of warming is a little bit uncertain depending on what kind of model you use and the time frame you're talking about, but we're certain that that warming will happen and it will have disastrous consequences. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take one more right down the end. I was. I, I, I somebody tweeted me earlier this week and said, quoting a, a, an historical report that it was a couple of days, I think it was four days until the Maldives, Maldives uh, were underwater. In a, in, in a way to say, look at this climate science that's always wrong. You know, the Maldives clearly, you can still go down to travel agent and get a holiday there. What do you have to say to someone? Or to comments like that. And said Sarah, you might. Like four days, it should have happened today. That's what they said. But we never do that. We never give protections like that. I don't actually know where that information comes from. Um, again, you, you touched on this at the beginning. You know, weather is something different to or if they're related, but it's not the same thing. So saying we well, can't forecast the weather four days out, you can't get the climate four years out is ridiculous. No one's putting a time frame on it that that's. It's that significant. Sometimes we put a 20 year window, um, a 10 year window, even when it's coming to these global warming thresholds. But no one's ever saying, right, tomorrow you should expect sea level rise at your door. I don't know where they're coming from. I suspect <laughs> somebody in the report said in 10 years' time, that's probably the day. Well, that's it. And this is released. perhaps, but saying that, you know, January 1st, 2028, the Maldives will be underwater. No one says it's around about this time with this level of warming. We expect to see changes like this. That's our best estimate. And this, I guess this goes back to, you know, that the plus or minus two degrees. That's our best estimate is the middle number, but it could be something within that range. And it's a similar sort of thing with the sea level rise. And I think the risk element, that's the best way I find it. And that's the IPCC expresses, um, you know, the relative risk of something happening again. You can't say that it will exactly happen on this day and so on. But most people understand that it, you know, if you um, don't wear a bike on, you increase the risk of, of, of having, you know, head injuries, but it won't be, you might be able to determine when you get run over by a <laughs> truck. Um, so we all understand that, and I think that's been useful uh, in the start, so that this report is very much around impact and risk, risk being, you know, the, the risk of future impacts. Excellent. All right. I think I would like, to invite each of you in a, in a tight minute, because we are getting close to time, um, to give me a, a final summary, a last thing you'd like to say to our audience, whether it's about your feelings for the future, your hopes, your uh, concerns, you know, really tight, your last opportunity on my <laughs> should, we, should we do it in reverse order? Should we go? You've got to run. This might sound a bit flippant, but just following on the conversation we just had, I'd like our government to make promising policies to give us a margin of error. <laughs> 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 There's a 2% bias.
cost five minus five percent error that you won't get this couple of dollars from the energy price that we're going to bring down to you <laughs> over the next four years, uh, or that we won't get this many jobs, or that we can even it's an attribution problem. Um, and what's interesting, the growth of attributes in science, climate science, is that you can now start to say you can not only make weather folk like yourself can say this is this is a sign of climate change rather than this is the thought of things you might expect. We've moved on there. But not only that, with a carbon budget now we can increasingly see who's 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 taking the major share of that, who's sucking it up, and is that justifiable? So I guess my 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 final word is to say, let's try and get onto this. Let's see who is using up the carbon budget the fastest and whether they have a reasonable case for that. Yeah. And if anyone's going to use it, who deserves to use it? And sort of make a moral issue sure. about how we manage that. Do we have a carbon budget? Mm -hmm. And I think we will end up with a lot of in our face in something. That debate can get started. Excellent. Thank you, Rob. The darkest hour of the <laughs> night is just before the dawn. Uh, it could not be much darker for Australia and climate policy. <laughs> and now, I'll take you right <laughs> Uh, 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 things will change. There is a very large base of support for action on climate change in this country. And when things start to roll back, uh, we have to make sure they keep rolling and go a long way. Uh, we, we can, let's take some heart from the fact that we can make quite a lot of progress in, in areas that, uh, have got momentum uh, in the current policy situation, especially the electricity sector, and give that every support that we can. Uh, but uh, let's have our thoughts and strategies ready for uh, 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 addressing the introduction of the comprehensive policies that are going to be necessary uh, as, the, uh, as the dawn comes. Uh, and uh, that we make the most use of the, the circumstances that um, will undoubtedly return. Thank you. Sarah. So I've got a couple of points. One is kind of in response to what we were saying earlier about politics, this is hopefully as lethal as I'll get. We're not drawing any bows, we're dra not drawing any long bows or any bows at all. It's scientific fact. We're not making things up. This is how it is. Take it or leave it. And it seems, unfortunately, like the Australian government is leaving it at the moment. So that, that's the first point. This is fact. That's it. It's going to get bad. It's, you know, it's getting worse and it's, it, 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 it will get bad as, as we hit warming threat, high warming thresholds. But there's still hope. If we don't get to one degree, yes, it will be worse at two degrees. But two degrees isn't as bad as three degrees. So if we don't hit one degree, we shouldn't be throwing our hands up in the air saying, oh, forget it, we're done, screaming toddlers for everyone. We need, it's still worthwhile investing in making the problem less by hitting those less warming thresholds as we go on. So there's hope. There is hope. <laughs> it's on you. So, what I want for Christmas, I understand that it was a small thing. It's a small envelope inside of a little piece of paper that says, uh, for all the politicians in Australia, we will now make our uh, decisions based on evidence. <laughs> and we're <before> all <laughs> <it's been done. laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please be thank all four of our panelists. <laughs> Please uh, do feel free to keep it going on Twitter and everywhere else in the social media landscape. Uh, we'll still be here for a moment. Make sure, of course, switch on to me. It's six o'clock in the morning on any <laughs> Please have a delightful evening. Thank you very much.